I will now take a photo of your of all of you because I will probably not remember anything about this moment uh, in 20 minutes. Hello everybody, I am this handsome man when somebody, you know, cleans me up and this is what I look like in the mornings, usually. Uh, my name is Panu Mampa and uh, I work as a strategic advisor, which is very difficult to say when you're a tad drunk, uh, at Milton. Uh, and I'm also uh, a master in philosophy from English language and uh, speech and presentation skills and useful subjects such as Slovakian, Hungarian and uh, gender studies. So when I was studying I was really aiming to make some big bucks uh, <laughs> with my combination. Uh, I have also studied drama and theatre studies uh, in the University of Kent at Canterbury um, for, for a very brief time, for three years when I had long hair I thought that I would be an actor and then I decided to cut my hair and get a real job. Uh, I have worked in uh, non-profit organizations most of my life um, because I believe that art and culture can save everybody. Um, and I've been doing that with uh, young children and young adults uh, for almost 15 years. And then I moved over to the bad capitalist side and I've been working in communications agencies for the past three years. But in the words of my favorite uh, movie, Notting Hill, I'm standing here just as a boy um, in front of you asking you to love me for the next 20 minutes. So let's have a short but a passionate affair together here about courage. So uh, I actually prepared this last night, so it's going to be a surprise for myself as, as it, it is for you. And I want to thank Creative Mornings and especially Barbara, uh, who met me on Wednesday when I was ready to throw myself under a tra train. Um, what, why am I here to talk about courage? Because in Wikipedia, which is always trustworthy, uh, courage is described in this manner, which was quite interesting because it talks about agony, pain, danger, uncertainty, intimidation, uh, hardship, death, um, uh, acting rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, discouragement, and personal loss. And this made me wonder, why do we value it so much? Because, you know, when you say courage and if you describe somebody to be courageous, you think that, you know, that person is full of valor and that's something to aspire to. And if I think about my heroes and, and the people that I look up to in my life, there are three people. Nelson Mandela, Madonna, and Yasser Arafat. And these are people that have stayed with me since I was like 10 or 12, because I remember I was like 10 or 11 when I, I read uh, the first story about Nelson Mandela, and I felt awful, because he was sitting in prison because he just wanted to have freedom. And I didn't understand th that. And my mother didn't understand why I wanted to go to South Africa and rescue him. And uh, I think that was sort of the beginning of my teenage years because, because it was horrible that she didn't let me go to South Africa to rescue Nelson Mandela, which of course, with my then self-esteem, I was sure that I could do. And then there's Madonna, that being a gay man myself, of course, she is the goddess. And, and whatever she does or says is, is the truth, is the Bible. And, and she has always been very courageous uh, in talking about to uh, people that don't have their own voice. And Yasser Arafat, I cannot imagine why uh, at 12 or 13 I thought that he is the best thing ever. <laughs> I just remember seeing him at the news and he was sort of, I liked the color of his uniform and I liked the funny <laughs> scarf. Uh, and he, always he was always smiling. And I understood that he was talking about oppressor, oppression and, and, you know, not having freedom to do what, what you wanted to do, but he was always smiling. And I thought that was really crazy, because obviously things were bad 
but he decided to confront them with a smile and invite people to come and talk about the hardships. So, I was thinking that why am I uh, the person uh, best qualified to talk about courage? And when I was studying at the University of Kent, my major was postmodern performance art, which meant that I got to do all crazy shit in the name of art. So I decided that this morning I will invite you uh, to be a part of my performance piece, which is called a lecture. And this lecture is on the ana anatomy of courage. Uh, I will be uh, performing the role of Professor Panu Mämpä from the University of Panu <laughs> and I will, And I can talk about courage because I've done over four decades of scholarly work on Panu Mämpäism. So I think in that sense I'm best qualified to talk about Panu Mämpä. And please tweet and, and Facebook and, and do whatever uh, so that we can get some Facebook rage during this uh, postmodern performance piece. So I thought that sort of to understand what, where courage derives from, we have to have uh, research and tests. So I've been testing courage on this test subject called Panu Mäenpää for almost 43 years now. And I will share with you the findings uh, of these tests. There are five cases in the past 43 years that, that we have been able to measure the courage of our test subject. The first one. This is our test subject at the tender age of three in 1978, which probably seems very odd to most of you since you seem so young, but there has been such a thing as 1970s. <laughs> and I was born in those years. Here he is, bright-eyed, living in a wonderful bourgeoisie family uh, in Seinäjoki, the center of civilization in Finland. <laughs> His father is a teacher in mathematics, and his mother is a nurse, and, and uh, he has two older sisters uh, who love him dearly. He is surrounded by wonderful uh, people and absolutely no care in the world until we get to 1980s and um, uh, his first uh, flight uh, outside of uh, Finland. In 1981, uh, he took a trip with his family to Romania, a holiday trip to the beach. And uh, he had been going to Sunday school ever since he, since he was like three or four and, and was, you know, the best friend of God. Sort of God was watching over him and he was very pretty sure about it. Uh, and then he got on a plane um, and the plane took off. And he was watching from the window. Uh, and his sister asked him that, you know, is it exciting why I was staring at the window? And he had said that, I'm looking for God and angels. Where are they? Because in Sunday school, they taught me that, um, you know, God is watching uh, at the clouds and, and all the angels are looking out. And he started crying because, you know, it was a huge disappointment. It was a huge letdown that he's been collecting these stickers every Sunday because he wanted to have more stickers than his best friend. And in the picture where you put the stickers, God was sitting above the clouds. So, my sister, who I mean his sister, uh, <laughs> who was then uh, 14, uh, couldn't sort of understand what she could do in order to stop this test subject from crying, but thankfully there were Budapest chocolates handed out at the airplane. And once this test subject got his hands on chocolate, he forgot about God. <laughs> so that sort of tells you about life's priorities. <laughs> and uh, from that uh, I want to derive the idea is that courage is allowing yourself to dream. 
You can always dream about God or whatever, but in the end, it, it's what you get in your hands that matters. But dreaming is something that you can do even if you're not able to uh, ever sort of catch it. So always believe in clouds, but always make sure that you have chocolate. Moving on, our test subject at the tender age of 14. As you can see, something has happened to my face uh, in the past 30 years. But this 14-year-old who looks very innocent uh, wasn't feeling very innocent. Because at 14 he was starting to realize that maybe he will not marry any girl from his class. Maybe he will not marry, maybe he will not become a teacher and she will become a nurse. Maybe they will not buy a house in Seinäjoki or a car or, oh I'm so sorry, <laughs> or, or get 2.5 uh, children and, and he will then start coaching the ice hockey team of his children. Because he was starting to sort of realize that he, he might be gay. And that's an awful feeling when you realize that, that you're, you are not predestined to do something. That life may not be planned out for you. That you may have to plan your life all over again. It is also a time, um, for, for six years he went to school where he got bullied every day. He got, got told several times a day that he's unfit, that he's queer, that he doesn't belong, that something he is thinking is unhealthy, um, and he shouldn't be there. Every day for six years. But still, he managed to put on his pants one leg at a time every morning and go to school. Because he realized that the only thing that is helping him out of that godforsaken town of Seinäjoki <laughs> is to get out of school and do something with his life. And the best thing that, ha that happened to him ever during that time was on his birthday in 1990 when the famous three letters entered his life, MTV. We got cable on April 11th, 1990. <laughs> and Madonna was visible every day in his room. And that made him realize that there is some form of life outside of Seinäjoki. And there are some other people that are unfit and queer and thinking about unhealthy things and also who get bullied every day. And they have survived. And he realized that there is something to aspire to. There's some, something coming up that, that sort of gives you the strength to survive yet another Monday at school. And that was fantastic. So at this point, I want to thank MTV. Thank you. <laughs> Even though I don't like it anymore. And courage is believing in your dreams. And, and having those dreams isn't enough. You have to believe in them. You have to have an idea that to watch, uh, with, to watch to, uh, your working to. And um, that is very important. If you don't believe in yourself, you have to believe in your dreams. And that's, at, at 14, it's much easier to believe in your dreams than in yourself when you start growing 20 centimeters all of a sudden in one week and have, um, and have pimples and, and you aren't as gorgeous as you are today. But your dreams are. They stay gorgeous all the time. So, I will skip the boring years of sex, drugs and rock and roll that were my 20s and go to my 30s where the most important life-changing thing happened to me when I was 31. My mother died um, after three years of battling with cancer, uh, which was horrible. It is horrible and I hate all the cancer movies nowadays where the person just, you know, sort of sl slowly slips away uh, with a poem on, on his or her lips. 
it doesn't happen like that. It's the ugliest thing that can happen to a person, is to die of cancer. But me and my mom here at 1978 <laughs> were really close. And um, when she died, I realized that nobody will love me as much as she, she did ever. Because she really loved me unconditionally for 31 years. I was the star of her life. Of course, my sisters, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you're watching, you know, you're important as well. But I mean, I was the baby, and I was a boy. And uh, it was horrible to realize that I could never experience that sort of love again. Which is normal. I don't want my partner, Matti, to love me like my mother did, no. <laughs> And I, but uh, the realization that I have lost something that I will never gain back, and also the sort of guilt that did I uh, give that love back the same way. Of course I didn't, because you know she was my enemy for like 10 years. Um, but th th that feeling was, was something that I had to get over with. And, and what helped me was Marimekko. I went to Marimekko outlet a year after she had passed away and I had decided to buy new curtains for my living room. And whenever I bought uh, any sort of, you know, uh, stylish things to my home, I used to phone my mother and, and send her pictures and ask her that, is this okay? And, and I'm not ashamed of saying it, even though as an adult, you know, I needed her approval. And I was standing at Marimekko outlet in Hertoniemi, and I had two curtain types to choose from. Um, and then all of a sudden I just thought, ah, oh, I have to call my mother. And I took out my phone and I realized that, you know, I cannot call her. And uh, that made me realize that now I have to live my life without her support. I need to be independent. At 31, after living 12 years away from home, that was the first time that I realized that I am an independent person. That I can buy whichever curtains I want to, and she will not be there nagging for that. And that was liberating. But that was also the first time that I realized that she will not be nagging to me ever again. And I remember I was standing in Marimekko outlet, and I was thinking that, you know, I need to cry, pee, shit, whatever. This is a horrible sensation. But then I also realized that I have to live my life according to what she taught me. And her motto was always that nobody cares how you feel as long as you look good. <laughs> so I realized that I will not be crying here in front of Mika Ihamuotila. I will be buying the curtains that are more expensive. <laughs> but that also made me realize that courage is giving yourself a break. You need to give yourself breaks once in a while. You don't have to be courageous all the time. You don't have to be on top of your game all the time. It is okay sometimes to cry in Marimekko outlet. And uh, I think I've done that since then, but that's because, you know, there has been a sale and, and, and I have a visa card. <laughs> so, but then another happening from 2013. This is my uh, home. Here, these windows used to be my home. It was Monday morning uh, at 5.45 uh, when I woke up to this loud banging on my door. And there was a fireman standing behind it saying two sentences to me. The house is on fire, we have to go now. Um, and I didn't realize what was happening. Um, I was just wearing my beautiful, lovely underwear. Uh, and I, I said to this fireman that, wait a minute. And I took a jumper. And then for some unknown reason, I said, wait another minute. And I went to the bathroom and took out my Givenchy, gentleman only, Cologne. <laughs> which to this day was the only thing that I rescued from a burning house. <laughs> which sort of tells a lot about me as a person and, and the death that I have.
But what was interesting when we were all standing here and we were looking at the burning building um, and I was sort of starting to realize that I will lose everything I own. Absolutely everything without the Givenchy. <laughs> um, it was a strange feeling because you thought, I, I saw all these people uh, crying next to me and I didn't cry. I felt very relieved. I was just thinking, well, now I can start all over again. The only thing that I sort of regretted was all of my books, because I have loads of books. And I never loan any books, because I want to buy them for myself, because I always write my thoughts uh, onto the pages, and I underline sentences that I want to use to appear intelligent. <laughs> and I thought that now all these records will be lost. I can always buy, you know, the books again. But all those important thoughts that I had when I was 21 will be lost. But I didn't care about the furniture or anything. And then I sort of shed a few tears because I thought that my history will be gone before I realized that my history will never be gone as long as I live. And also, if I forget some memories, it's okay because they are not memories worth remembering. And, and that Tomorrow is another chance for me to do uh, new memories. And even though I will lose everything, tomorrow will still come. And just like at 14, I have to put on my pants one leg at a time and go on. Even though I didn't have any pants at the moment, which was, <laughs> which was ver very difficult. Didn't shave my legs either, but um, I remember MTV Kolme came up to me and said that can they interview me for, for the morning news and I said that this is not my 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> Pantless that, you know, if I'm going to be on TV, I want pants. <laughs> but it was interesting. It was an interesting experience and after that it has been very interesting to sort of, you know, buy things and, and move because it's so easy to get rid of, you know, junk. Because the more, most important thing that I have to keep with me is myself. And also the idea that tomorrow will come. That whatever happens today, tomorrow I have to get up, put on my pants, one leg at a time, and go on. Well, then, a de defining moment. This is morning television in Ule. Here I, here I am as the president of SETA. And here is Jukka Pekka, who was the president of Aito Avioliitto organization. Um, I worked as the president of SETA for two years, uh, talking about LGBTI rights everywhere. And at the time, you know, we had the Tahdon movement and, and equal marriage and all that. And this has been the longest 13 minutes of my life. Because this person, we were sitting at, at the foyer and, you know, without blinking an eye, he was looking at me and saying that, you know, I am not entitled to the same rights as he is. And then we went on national television where he also looked at me and said that I am not as worthy as he is. And this happened on national t television, but it also happened for two years. It happened to me every day when I was walking here in Helsinki somebody would recognize me and come up to me and tell me that I was wrong. That as a gay man, I should be ashamed. Uh, why am I asking for equal rights? You know, because it's obvious that I, 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 don't, I am not worthy of them. I would get letters to the SETA office because my address <laughs> was, was secret, because I knew that this would happen. Uh, I would get emails and calls every day for two years where people would be shouting at me and telling me what a horrible person it was. And it was funny because it was my life at 14 all over again. But now I was over 30. And what, why it was funny and why it was liberating is that I didn't care. I didn't care what these people thought. It didn't affect the idea that I had of myself or other gay people or the fact that I want to get married. 
there, were, there was this one stalker who used to send me a memo every Monday. Uh, it, was, it was in the form of a press release. Um, and it always involved me dying during the weekend in some horrible manner. Uh, that was scary, because obviously this person knew me from Seinäjoki, because this person knew my sisters, this person knew my father and mother, and all interesting details about my life. But I got used to that. But then there were the death threats, which I received so many that I can't remember how many there were. But there was a time when I used to go home uh, through the back door, because I was afraid to use the front door, because I was sure that one of those people who said that they would be waiting me at my door and kill me would be there. But then I realized that I have to have more respect, more respect on myself, that if I have chosen to do this and talk about these things, I have to live my life regardless of these people. Because if I don't do that, I would be disrespecting all those people that I represent. And that made me realize that courage is respecting yourself. Courage is being happy with who you are and being happy to express yourself. Thankfully, this period in my life ended <laughs> when the year 2016 ended. And thank you for saying that I will, shall not be returning ever. <laughs> but it was, it was a very interesting time. But thinking about um, today, you know that you are in love with somebody or you like somebody, and what is the most impo important thing that you can do to show that to the world is to hold hands. And also hold the hand of the person that you love, because you like the warmth of that person's hand and body, and you like to know that that person is next to you and with you. To me, this has always been a political act. And even today, it's a political act every day when I do it in Helsinki. Before I hold my partner's hand, I have to check if the place is secure enough. Are we in the middle of Helsinki or are we in some su suburbs that somebody might consider this to be an offense and somebody might consider this to be a challenge for them to challenge me. And that is horrible. That is horrible that before I take Matti's hand, I have to check if I can show my affection. And this is something that I used to do. I always used to, we were walking somewhere and, and I was like, oh my God, this wonderful, gorgeous uh, person with a good physique and wonderful personality, and I want to hold his hand, but I don't sh I'm not sure if I can. You know, are we in Seinäjoki, are we in Kontula, are we in Ullanlinna? And I decided that that's the most horrible thing that I can do to myself, is to censure myself because I am afraid. And then I realized that courage is not censoring yourself. Courage is following your heart and doing what your heart desires. Even though there might be consequences, but at least it's worth it because you're true to yourself. And my conclusion of all of these studies in the University of pa Panumampa, in the major of Panumampaism, is that courage is all of these things. But what do all of these things have in common? When thinking about dream, dreams, or giving yourself a break, or believing in tomorrow, respecting yourself, or not censoring yourself, what is in common with all of these things? Well, one thing, hope. And in the end, courage is hope, and hope is courage. Because as long as we believe in tomorrow, as long as we believe that there are people who want to do good things to me, and people who, who are ready to love me, there is courage. As long as I can trust that some, something good will happen, I am prepared to do anything in this life. 
I have a tattoo on this ha hand that says Kindness of Strangers, which is uh, from Tennessee Williams's play Streetcar Named Desire, where Blanche Dubois, a wonderful character, uh, that's her last line before she is taken to a mental institution. She says, all we can do is rely on the kindness of strangers. And I have it on this hand so that I am always constantly reminded that I should op open it up to people and be shake uh, hands of strange people. Because I have to be, I have to believe that there's some kindness that they want to give to me and to the world. So my conclusion is that courage isn't something that is found within you. Courage is something that you can hope to see in other people. Courage to love you. And, uh, and I think that is the most important thing to learn. Just like Nelson Mandela says, a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. So after all of these things that happened to the uh, life of the test subject. To this day, he still believes and he still hopes every day that he will meet interesting people that will love him. He, will, he also knows that he will be sorely disappointed every day and he will meet assholes and bastards, but it doesn't matter because they are not the whole planet. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm sort of regaining my consciousness <laughs> in a few minutes. <laughs> I told you that's always a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> and you can also ask me questions on Twitter if you want to. You have your phone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing, um, like, I remember like, when, when you were thinking about and get, getting, get, having those death threats like coming to you mm -hmm. every fucking day, um, like where 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 does that strength come from? To like okay, like and to kind of decide like every day to make the decision. I I'm standing here. I'm continuing this. This is not like I'm not letting this affect my work. I think it was through especially the phone calls that I got because the, it was usually the people who. You could hear that there's nobody that listens to them. That they have seen me on the news or in the newspaper or heard me on the radio. And they, they have this huge anger probably towards life, not just Panu Mampa, Because I don't think I'm that interesting that you can devote yourself uh, to, to hating me. And, and, you know, I would answer some of the emails that I got that weren't like, you know, fuck you, queer, go fuck yourself. I mean, especially the people that could write to me in a fashion that they could say that why, why they think like this. But I think it's, it's a reflection of our society nowadays where we long to be seen and less and less people in this planet are seen actually. Because we are so interested in, in seeing celebrities and seeing um, bloggers and seeing, you know, interesting uh, people that we don't see each other. Because we wake up every day hoping that we would be as fabulous as, as some, some celebrity. So we don't take the time to actually meet the people that we spend our days with. So I think it's anger, anger towards their own situation. And, and it's also anger probably because they don't respect themselves. So when I realized that probably, well, hopefully none of them will come to my door and want to kill myself, want to kill me, um, if I just get, give them the chance to vent out their feelings, they will not harm any, you know, 
anonymous gay person there because they have had the chance to tell what a horrible person Panama Man Pai is. Well, I think that people who work in social services or in the parliament or as Murphys in, in Ratikka or uh, the Finnish football, national football team, I think all these people are much more courageous than I am because they go to work every day knowing that everybody hates them. <laughs> um, but my tip is not to take it personally. And, and through this journey of our test subject, I wanted to show that every stage that you are confronted with a situation where you have to be courageous, courageous it sort of builds your, your courage bank. And, and if you survive all these situations, uh, none of the situations that you get into are, you shouldn't fear because you know that you will make it through. I know every morning when I put on my pants that I will survive this day because I've had these experiences. Um, but I think with, with them and with all of us, whenever we are faced with a person full of hate and anger, it's always, we always have to remember that it's not towards us, probably, if we are just, you know, we haven't done anything for that, to that person. But it's anger that doesn't have any other outlet than me. And this is something actually that I learned from sitting at, at, as a cashier in Antila for, for all those years when I was studying, when, when I would be hated because Voimarini was, was much uh, more cheaper in some other store. It, we are all just cashiers at Antila, and, <laughs> and that, that moment will pass, but we are helping that person because we are receiving that anger but we don't have to take it in ourselves. We can sort of leave it then somewhere. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Exactly. <laughs> because that is something that we have to do every day. Uh, Milton doesn't allow, to me, allow me to be pantless. <laughs> I haven't asked, actually, if they probably would, but... Uh, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Oi. Hi, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank you for this talk. And one thing I think that was the pivotal essence of your talk was that you were very much able to show your personality. And that's something I'm also thinking about myself when you're applying jobs and mm. when you're making your CV videos, how you could really put yourself out there and how mm. you could show your personality. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. There's a large drag queen living inside of me. <laughs> and I, I am trying to contain it with these pants. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about the fact that, as you said, when you were 14, you understood that life didn't unfold as you planned. And I think that's something that everyone of us at some point of our lives, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, this, this, is, this is, isn't what I ordered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, pro I probably also think that kind of having that notion at 14 also kind of, it's something that, that has built up in a way. Or that I asked earlier also, like, mm. why we were able to stand there, like, and just take, take and being, being mm -hmm. the flow of 
and saying, okay, this, that's, that's not me, it's, it's you. Mm. Which, which I notice sometimes it's, it's difficult, like having, getting feedback mm. and really kind of being like really aware of, okay, it's, 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 it's not me. They, mm. They're criticizing my work or they don't like something I've done, but it's, it's not me, it's something else. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's, and it's not easy, but it's just like a, it's a practice you have to do like every day. Yeah, yeah. And especially at 14, the society in Finland w was was that kind that it wasn't like like I love today when I am able to stand here and say that I'm a proud gay man. But when I was 14, it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible when I was 20 or 24, and things have moved really quickly in the past few years. And it's very difficult to sort of realize that. I, and I and, and sort of wonder all the choices that you have made your, in your life that is it because I didn't want to or is it because I didn't believe that I am entitled to? And this is something that still I think about every day. Uh, but the only thing that, it, that, that is, is a fact is that life never goes according to plans. <laughs> and. Uh, those cards that you are handed out this morning, you know, you have to make the most of it with your pants on. <laughs> Well, I think it's just what you said, that they don't have uh, the instigating facts to, to do something else. Because as people, you know, we like to be lazy and comfortable, that, and that is okay. And if nothing happens that challenges our laziness or, or comfortability, uh, we like to stay on that path. And I think that is, is a good, valuable path to be on. I'm not judging people if they are afraid or if they, are, uh, they have courage. They are equally worthy. Um, I'm sure I would be very happy living in Seineoki with my nurse wife and our 2.5 children, Volvo and dog. Um, but I have been blessed with homosexuality and, and that opened so many doors for me that I probably would have never gone through if, if I wouldn't have the opportunity to redirect and re-decide everything in my life. And it would have been nice if that would have happened when I was 25, but that happened when I was 14, so I had all these things to worry about, my gayness, my pimples, my fat ass. But still, uh, I think those people who, who we call fearful or who are afraid are just comfortable. And being comfortable is okay. For me, it took almost 30 years to be comfortable. And, and through those years, um, I learned a lot. But, but sometimes you see people who are not comfortable that they're mm. too afraid to be. I don't know what has, what has happened in their lives. But I cannot judge them to be below me still. Because they, you know, we have to put on our pants every morning and we have to survive the day. And they will do whatever they have to do to survive their day. So. We cannot all be blessed with homosexuality, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody comes up to a stage and, and opens up. 
and, and tell us something and share something from their life. Um, it makes me it, it makes it easier for me to share something from my life. And and it's it's a remi reminder that, that we're all here together and we all have our 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 crosses too. As you said, we're not all blessed with homosexuality. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But carry your heterosexuality with pride. Yes. Thank you. Also, give a big hand again. Yeah.